Hi guys. So this episode is really special because we did it live. That's right, live. And most of you joined us for this special live episode and you guys were giving us your questions and your comments and it was so much fun. It was so interactive and I'm sure we're going to do this again. For this episode, we were joined by Vince Wright and Ian Gray from the Talking Elvis podcast and also the Elvis in Cambridge radio show over there in the UK. All right, you guys, this is unedited. You're going to hear it exactly like it was when we recorded it live this past Saturday, April 4th. Oh yeah, look at that. Hello. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Are we really out there? I totally didn't spot myself. I'm so brave. Wow, look at you. Yeah. Where are we? We're missing Mike Ford. Hopefully Mike will look at his phone, see my text messages, and join us for this special Jungle Room Podcast Facebook Live edition. I am Jamie Kay, and Jungle Room Podcast is brought to you by Pizza Man in Eagle River, Alaska, but I am not alone. I have these wonderful guys, Ian Gray and Vince. Hello. Hi. Hiya. <laughs> How is everyone? How are you guys doing? Well, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good here. Um, I've been, I've been, yeah, and being I, I, I'm well right away here. Yeah, I've been about had a productive day um, in isolation, been um, cooking. Um, uh, t- <laughs> the house has never been so clean. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're all good. Yeah, pretty good. How it's a great missed? chance to catch up. Really good, yes. I've, uh, I've I've just been doing so many of the silly little jobs that I've wanted to do for years. It's great. <laughs> it's good to catch up. It's good to catch up. It's a bit of a stop the world I want to get off, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's having that breather and just going, right. right, we know what we've got to do, so let's do it. Yeah, yes. And I think it's very important that we just continue to take every day as it comes we can't rush this. There's no easy answer, and we just have to make the best of it. Yeah, Indeed. definitely. Indeed, uh, yeah, yeah. What have you been up to, Jamie? Well, <laughs> I went on a walk from with lost. my dog <laughs> and my daughter, and we 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 started. It, 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 it the weather here in Alaska is just nice. It's great, and we went to mm-hmm. the park and. We decided to walk by my friend's house and and talk to her from the driveway. She came out on her deck. And then I'm like, okay, it's 11, 11, 15, 11, 20. I need to get back because we're going to do this live show, right? And uh, we're just walking the dog. And I I look, I tell my daughter, I'm like, we're going the wrong way. And she's like, no, we're not. No, we're not. I'm like, I don't know where we are right now. And I've lived in this neighborhood for like, you know, 20 years or something. (laughs) So I got lost (laughs) in my neighborhood. So I had to call my husband and like, hey, you got to come get me. I'm on Northern Lights and it's like I have to be live in like 10 minutes. And so, yeah, my poor husband had to drive <laughs> to come pick his wife who got lost in her neighborhood. So that, he was, saved that was my day. life today. You, you need a, an assistance dog, you know, a guide dog. Yeah, we, we picked it, the wrong dog yeah, rather, to take for a walk. Yeah, they would have taken you home. Yeah, but she's Sutton still walking. Dog. She's still not even back here. <laughs> like, I, he just came and picked me. I left her. I'm like, okay, I'll see you back at the house. <laughs> the dog was muddy. He didn't need to get in the Jeep. It's fine. It's all good. <laughs> oh, that parents of the year award goes to. Well, she's sixteen. If she did, she's the one that she's the reason why we got lost. I, I was yeah. listening to her. I have this bad habit. Like when I'm by myself and I'm, you know, I, I I never forget where I park my car. I always take mental notes of my surroundings. Something happens to me when I'm with someone else. It's like I, I'm like I'm four years old or something, and I'm just dependent on the other person to know where we are. And that's yeah. totally not a cool way to be. And now I just told yeah. you guys way too much about me. But, I yeah. guess I, we will now call you mom brain. It's all right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Something like that. <laughs> so we've got some people hopping on. I want to say hi to David Marr. He's saying hi, Jamie, and hi, guys. Memphis hi, says hi. Hi, hi David. Hi, Memphis. Oh, she's hey, a Hey, hello to Memphis. Yeah. And John is on. Hi, John. So you guys, we are going to start the discussion. And if you guys have any questions or you have any comments, interact with us. We're going to try to get to as many of the questions in the comments as we can. 
Uh, I think Ian just opened up a bottle, so I think he's good on time. Vince, how are you doing on time? I'm I'm uh, I'm good to go till the sun comes up. Okay. Yeah, this is nine o'clock there, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly is. Oh my gosh. Okay. So yeah, we're just getting started. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's noon here, so I don't. I'm not sure. Is that is that okay to drink now or like? Yes. It yes. Is? Of it's it five o'clock yes. somewhere. It's yes, it's always good. Okay. All right. So, Chips Moment. He was the producer who has been credited to reviving Elvis's career. Now, he was a Memphis producer. He was a musician and a songwriter. Um, and most of us in America, we know him to have recorded with Willie Nelson, Moore Haggard. And this guy was just phenomenal. And I don't know if you guys remember on a past Jungle Room um, podcast episode, Dave and I were talking, my my first co-host, about the Highwayman. And if Elvis would have been a member of, of, of the oh, Highwayman. Oh, yes. So he wrote a lot of the songs for the Highwayman. Um, this guy was just phenomenal. Now, back in 1969, he um, produced the album from Elvis in Memphis, which was released, released in 1969. And this was credited for Elvis. This was like one of his biggest albums. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. This, this, I think it's underrated, but it, now, historically, it stands there, doesn't it? Yeah. It, I, yeah, I, big, big seller in the UK, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Why? So how did you guys know how it came about, Elvis and Chip um, coming together? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, oh. yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll go with a, with a brief, uh, brief thing. Um, RCA were looking... Uh, to capitalize on the Elvis's 68 uh, success and uh, get some uh, new material in the can. And of course, live performances were, were in the pipeline as well. Um, but Elvis didn't really want to go out to um, Nashville uh, and to his usual recording recording uh, haunts. He wanted to do something a bit local. And I think it was, was it Lamar Fike? Was it who had uh, connections with the uh, Memphis yeah, Sound Studio so, with Chips yeah. Merman? Yeah, so Elvis Elvis fancied something uh, a bit more local, and uh, I think Lamar Fike and a few of his buddies persuaded him, didn't they, to uh, to go to American Sound in Memphis rather than uh, go across the country. I think we hear that story from two different ways, don't we? If you if you look around, because so, some claim it was the other way, don't they? Up, oh, up. Oh, guess who's oh. calling me right now? Hey, come and join us. Well, hello, Mr. <laughs> Ford. You are live Hello, right now. Are you, already, are you already doing stuff? Um, yeah, we're on. Can can I call you on Skype and have you join us? Yes, you can. Okay, to we're gonna help do my this. wife do something. Give me, give me, give me two minutes. I'll be, okay. I'll be there. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. You guys, you heard that? Everyone heard that? I don't think he realizes yeah. that we're actually live right now. <laughs> live in programming. Uh, programming. There we go. Okay, well, he's, he's got a couple more minutes. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, yeah, it's. it's like I say, it was it was Lamar Fike who, who we think who we think um, instigated this. Uh, he was he was in there with uh, with Chips Moman and Tommy Cogbill, people like that. And uh, they were they were looking to get some more. Um, let's have a look. They were they were, tr they were trying to promote the American recording studios, weren't they, Vince? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's the thing that, that where you you know. I've loved this story for years because there's been a, a few variations of it. Um, that you know, does he want to get to Nashville and do the, the standard stuff, or was it Elvis who didn't? Um, looking it up this afternoon, you get that again. But they've got the local interest. I mean, we've already got you've got Sun Studio, you've got Stacks. You know, Memphis is as good as it gets, isn't it? And then you've got American Sound as well. So, however that worked out, he did it. <laughs> Why do you think that they never worked together again? The Colonel. <laughs> yeah, Colonel Tom Diskin. That, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I mean, Tom Diskin made an appearance, didn't he, um, at the studios uh, during, um, during one of the times and had a, shall we say, a slight disagreement with Chip's moment, didn't they? Because, yeah, um, the, the Suspicious Minds one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and basically, basically, what what happened is 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 that is that Tom Diskin, on behalf of the Colonel, wanted all the rights. He wanted all the 
what did he want? The selling, the selling right, the whole publishing, thing. Publishing, publishing everything. That's it, publishing, yeah. And, um, and Chip's mum said, here, have it, go away and don't ever darken my door again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody cracked somewhere, didn't they? Yeah. You know, because Elvis, it's... Elvis went back. Yeah, you know... <laughs> okay. Good Lord, oh, okay. what's that? Is Mike, are you here? Hi, Mike. I am. Oh. Hey, there's a, there's a real person. Hi. Hey, hey, we can see Mike. <laughs> oh, he's on. Okay, cool. All right, well, we're, we're talking about Chip Smolman and um, Elvis Presley, obviously Elvis. And uh, the guys just made a good – we just asked the question, why do you think uh, Elvis and Chip never worked together again? And you missed this, Mike, because guess who was behind Elvis and Chip never working together again? Did he just freeze? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah. Okay, can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. There now. we go. Okay, I'm going to say Colonel Parker just because of the way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, right I don't there. know if you realize this, but Mike is a huge fan of Colonel Tom Parker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've listened to all the podcasts, and, and I know make, that to be facts. Any Anybody that can make chickens dance on a hot plate has got my vote, you know? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Excellent. Oh my god! It's going to be good to see them uh, do that in the movie with Tom Hanks, isn't it? Because they'll be done for cruelty and everything. After CGI chickens, could be amazing. Yes. I hope that they address that in the movie. Yes. Do, have you read anything about that part of, of the of this film? No, not yet. Not yet. I think well, obviously. Well, how about so- his mis- How about his mysterious? Uh, um, the reason he never left the country. That, that would be also interesting. To oh, the whole, uh, yeah. The film. yeah. Yeah, we talked the about dog- that with Alana Nash when she was on the show. You know, she wrote the book. Oh, she did the book, yeah. Yeah, Colonel Tom Parker. And, and there was a rumor that uh, Colonel Tom Parker may have murdered someone. Yeah. A woman. So um, I know that. Uh, oh, the, you mean besides the chicken? But, yeah, besides <laughs> the chicken. Yeah. What do you guys think? Do you think that really happened? Yeah. You do, Vince? <laughs> I, I, I like, really yeah. do. You do. I want to believe. I want to believe that it, that it did. Yeah, because it all adds to the mystery, and it all adds to um, uh, an even more. I mean, in Alana Nash's book. I mean, I started reading it, and it's, it's very, very deep and comprehensive. It's, it's the most comprehensive read that I've ever had. Um, in relation to the Colonel, I, I really want these sort of stories to be true because there's a great movie in that just on the Colonel alone, never mind his relationship with Elvis. Oh, yeah, The Dodgy Dutchman is going to be the title of it. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Mike? Do you think that uh, Colonel Tom Parker uh, killed someone? You know, I think he uh, killed Elvis's dreams. Oh, that's Ooh, good. That's, that's harsh. That's that harsh. No, but that's, We've I can, got Dr. Bear. Phil on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Mike, don't <laughs> sit on the fence. Tell us what you mean. <laughs> yeah, what do I really feel? I don't really think. No, but I did think when she was on, Jamie Kay, that uh, she mentioned that she, I, I like the fact that she gave props to the things that Colonel Parker actually did bring to rock and roll and uh, live entertainment, you know, uh, and it, it really dawned on me that before Elvis, nobody was doing any sort of the concession type things or, you know, or getting the memorabilia out at concerts. And, uh, you know, he brought the carnival like atmosphere to rock and roll. So that I would, it, I would never would have thought about that. The first guy to do memorabilia in, in house, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Properly big time, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you had Bill Black selling photos out the boot, didn't you, before? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> now, when Elvis died, after Elvis's death, you know, Colonel Tom <clears throat> Parker, it was business as usual. He just continued to, as if Elvis hadn't died. I mean, he, he went back to work. It, well, it, I always remember them saying at the time, it was the best career move Elvis ever made was dying. Oh, um, yeah. Because it just went through the roof, didn't it? So, so it was more than business as usual. It was cha-ching. 
I think I think the colonel uh, was was keen to um, make the most of it. Certainly, yeah, post nineteen seventy seven, wasn't he? And uh, <laughs> he certainly seemed to have the money to do so in the, in in Las Vegas casinos, didn't he? So, uh... you know, we, we we talk a lot about what Colonel um, Tom Parker didn't do for Elvis. What are some things that you think that he did do for Elvis's career? Oh, he created him, didn't he? He he. It w- we wouldn't have had an Elvis without him. Well, I, he, he, I, I he created, think it's that, that important. He created mainstream hysteria, didn't he? Um, because he, Elvis would have been there, but strictly on a local level, probably, and, and probably not as big. Well, and you got to wonder how much did he did uh, Brian Epstein model what he did for the Beatles after Elvis? Yeah, what Colonel Parker did. It's it shadows it, doesn't it? It really is the same sort of deal. Don't overexpose. Do it. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with that one, like that. I'm sorry. I had um, my friend Elizabeth. I, so I just got a text message. Uh, she's saying she can't find us um, live, but we're on the Facebook group page, or not the group page, the actual page, and, and we're live. So I'm hoping everyone is able to find us. We have yeah, I've got you on a. That, that, yeah, I've, I've got you on a couple of streams, so that's that's pretty good. Yeah, let me see if I can. Um, you guys keep talking. Don't mind me. I'm just going to help some people get get on here. Tell her to tell her to pull the string tighter on her can. <laughs> <laughs> technical right. advice there. That's, uh, that's, that's that's the technical era I come from. Alaskan Wi-Fi. That's <laughs> right. Alaskan Wi-Fi. <laughs> Campbell's cans and a taut string. <laughs> but you know what with the colonel you know he's always going to be a talking point isn't he he's he's, he's going to be um the the leading the leading what if person in elvis's life and career um gladys apparently didn't like the colonel didn't trust the man um and i think vernon was was just scared of him i, I think anyway yeah you know i asked alan on that i asked her if she if Elvis was scared of Colonel, um, I don't think Elvis was scared of him physically, but I do think that there was some fear there. I think Colonel Tom Parker held something over on Elvis. It could have been, it may have been the drugs. It could have been uh, his relationship with Priscilla because she was underage. He, he, he kept something over on Elvis what, because Elvis was not known to be a wallflower. He wasn't someone that would let just any anyone walk over him, but he, the Colonel Tom Parker had such a power over this man that he that he would, you know, fire him, and then the Colonel would like say, "Okay, well, you owe this amount of money," and Elvis would walk back in line. But I think he hadn't. Elvis didn't have the business sense and in the nicest possible way, mm-hmm. so he was stitched up, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he was him and him and uh, Vernon were very very naive when it came to business dealings, wasn't it? And um, the Colonel would have quite easily have said to them, "So, well, you go ahead, you book the concert tours, you book Vegas, you book the stadiums, you, yeah, you, you deal with RCA records, you know, and and please do be my guest, get on with it." And they just said, "Whoa, no, no," because they'd never done that. The only the only um, deal that Elvis ever negotiated by himself was probably with uh, Scotty Moore or, or somebody like that, wasn't it? Was with Sam Phillips uh, back in the 50s. Um, and that was a very small potatoes compared to uh, what was to come with RCA and uh, Colonel Parker. Yeah. Well, and the other part, Jamie Kay, that you mentioned about Priscilla and the underage thing, you know, <clears throat> let's remember that was just a couple of years after Jerry Lee Lewis's little thing oh, with yeah. his underage cousin. Oh, yeah, right. And, and, it and, you know, Jerry Elvis Lee and Lewis Jerry Lee were, Lee were pals. Yeah, so. yeah, you know that, and that's haunted him for years. Though, that's so interesting to me. You know, Jerry Lee Lewis married. They he actually married the, the girl, and his career was just completely over. Elvis was dating more than one young girl, and it was almost like the media, the report, like they they had more. They gave Elvis a free pass on so many things. Why do you guys think that was? Elvis was less controversial than Jerry Lee Lewis for a start. Um, Elvis was, uh, he went into the army, he did his thing, he, he was clean cut. Um, he was the boy next door almost, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. But that was only post-army, really. He was still a rocker before. 
Yeah, but the six the sixties is when all this sort of stuff was going on, wasn't it? Yeah, so I was just saying, well, for when for when that happened, then you know you'd got uh, Buddy Holly you died, you'd got that sort of end of an era of one. You know, the the fifties ended in sixty one, didn't it? <laughs> it's, it, it's, it sort of carried carried over that little bit. Um, so I think the new the new sanitized Elvis, the the um, the Sinatra show Elvis. Um, is the new is the new beginning there, isn't it? With the with the clean cut boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And, you know, what I do have... you guys take on on the movies, though? That's the that's the part that interests me the most. Because when, when he, I mean, he really could act. He could. And then yeah. they started with those just pablum kind of um, uh, setups, and and you know. Uh, and let's have a fight. Let's have a dance. Let's sing two songs, and and then he gets the girl. You know, it's yeah. just kind of a well. It, you know, the way the formula. colonel, the way that he looked at it, Mike, it, uh, it, it was making money. Yeah. He, he didn't care about Elvis's artistic, you know, vibes. Like, you know, Elvis wanted to do meaty roles, and you know, like Rock Hudson and uh, Marlon Brando. But what Colonel's end game was: this is what's making money. And Elvis yeah. had a habit of spending a lot of money, a lot, and so he, to get out of whatever debt he got himself into, was to make one of those cheesy movies. Yeah, there were one or two actors in the sixties, weren't there, who decided they were going to go their own way and do one or two independent things and uh, come away from the main studios. And um, not all of them were, were as successful as as the likes of other Cary Grant. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of them, a lot of them sort of fell by the wayside for two or three years, and and really had to work hard to get back into the, into the movie making system and to make money. And this is, uh, this is another thing that Elvis was like, well, I don't want to do that just in case. Do you think? Well, I I, I always think that that the army killed his acting career because you look at uh, at King King Creole, you've got a massive cast of you know, things like Walter Matthau. You've got the best director going. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a top-notch movie there, and then you, you know, finish that. Join the army. Had that not been army time, then, then would we have got the serious films? Because we went do the army, do that bit for a couple of years, come out, and and the cheesy formula was invented. Had we just gone, okay, you finish filming King Creole, do a bit of a tour. Now, Ross, the next film. Then I feel we'd have had the gutsy ones because things like Wild in the Country and Flaming Star must have been bubbling under, as talked about. Um, And even Roust About, wasn't it, originally was talked about as an earlier one, Um, you know, with with a bit more with a bit more guts to it. So I, I, I think the army there, the colonel took that as the we can reinvent him where we would have had we would have had the James Dean kind of Elvis. And here's the thing with Flaming Star and, and uh, Wild in the Country. They weren't as successful as G.I. Blues and uh, Blue Hawaii. Either side of them, were they? No, no. not at all. No. So there we go. There's, 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 there's your answer. Yeah. But that's because we've got the sanitised in, in the nicest way, uh, you know, one where I think if we'd have still got the James Dean, if we'd have still got the, the King Creole Elvis, we, we could have had still had a boatload of songs but a cracking a cracking role. And, and in the 60s, I mean, Elvis wasn't doing any, uh, especially in the mid-60s, uh, he wasn't doing any live performances. So for us, for fans to hear him sing, was the movies. Ah, uh, you had to go to the movies. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, today we take it for granted, don't we? we? We can see whoever we want, whenever we want, on whatever channel we want, don't we? Uh, back in the day, uh, if you didn't see Elvis in the movies, you didn't see Elvis. And as he didn't do a world tour, you had even less, you know, had he only been touring the States, we'd have still been screwed. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Mm. That is true. So since we're, we're, we're going to wrap around, go back to, to, to Chip's moment in a minute, but well, I want to <laughs> ask you guys, um, since we were all here, let's start with Mike. What is your favorite Elvis movie that you can watch over and over again? Oh, it's got to be Viva Las Vegas. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't say that he was, I can't say that uh, when he's on screen with Anne Margaret is, is the best he, in that formula was the best he ever was. You know, the electricity that comes through, even on television, watching that, you know, it's, it's amazing. Their chemistry just, was uh, off the charts. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. She was the only one that was ever like close to to you know matching his matching his energy. Right. And it was it was incredible. And she was called the female Elvis Presley. Yeah, I was. Did she come out with that book yet? Uh, Anne Margaret. Yeah. Did she wrote it. She, she wrote out? a book. In, I like, think in nineteen ninety four. But the, but she's very very tight lipped about her relationship with Elvis. So she doesn't really uh, divulge yeah. any good details that we would want to know. She she's kept his trust <laughs> even after death. Yeah, that's uh, that's the behind the scenes that I'd really love yeah. to read. Yeah. You know, that's. I thought, yeah, there's something that, yeah, that's, to, to me, that's the movie. Yeah. All right, Vince? Yeah, ooh, so uh, I'd say King Creole. Yeah. I, 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 I can watch that as a really good quality movie. You could take the songs out and it would still be a cracking movie. Mm -hmm. Ian? Yeah, I mean, I, I love black and whites. So I love black and white 40s and 50s uh, movies. So King Creole um, is always going to be the main one for me. But um, I, I, I I always fall back on Blue Hawaii if I want a good sing song because there's, like, there's plenty of songs in that movie, you know, and, uh, and I love the music from that, from, from, from there. And that's uh, one day I'll be, I'll be there um, in Hawaii. If I'm not looking for Steve McGarrett and Magnum PI, I'll be I'll be looking for Elvis sites to go and visit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I also love King Creole. That's a movie I can watch over and over again. Jailhouse Rock, I, I, I love that movie. I I can watch it over and over again, and w without fail, just let it watch it. And I notice something different each time. But another movie yeah. that I don't think gets a lot of credit, and that's um, Live a Little, Love a Little. It's yes. so funny. It's so edgy. It's just a really, it really shows his uh, comedic side. I, I, th I think he did a great job in that movie. That's almost a Doris Day Rock Hudson type of movie, isn't it? Yeah. It's so, and it's, almost, and yeah. it's you know, a little, it's a little edgy for its time. I mean, you, you all, you got to see, you know, he even, you know, cursed in the movie. Yeah. Um, there is. The whole plank in the bed yes yeah, yeah it's <laughs> it's a it's a very cute movie it's funny i think it's one of those movies that either jokes still you know stand the test of time i i, mm. I love that movie i like it Joe, you know, i've always thought that um change of habit should have become a tv series oh yes Oh yeah, gosh, the, about the, the ghetto doctor and the, and the the nun, whether she does or she doesn't stay. Um, so I, when I watch that film, I always think there should have been a series because it was filmed where they filmed Kojak and everything else. Yeah. So it, the, the sets were were perfect, uh, and that was again that that edgy sixties with the gangster and the drugs and the knife attacks. Very um, gritty feel. Yeah, really good for that. And also Charo. Charo is also another movie that is my all-time favorite because I love westerns. I just love him in that movie. He's just. Hey, we should do a Facebook poll, Jamie K. We should. Okay, you guys. There's uh, there's 16 people on listening to us. Why don't you guys comment and let us know what your your favorite movie is um, that Elvis starred in and, and why? Yeah. Go ahead. Not everybody speak up at once, but. Yeah, okay. and favorite uh, and favorite leading lady. That would oh be a good yeah, one oh favorite leading lady. Well, let's you guys let us know who your favorite leading lady is. Let's ask the roundtable here. Um, since we started with Mike first, let's start with Ian. Ian, your favorite leading lady in an Elvis movie. Well, we just did uh, on Talking Elvis. We just did exactly that last in the last yeah, edition, we did. and um, we unanimous, unanimously came up with uh, Anne Margaret. Because, you know, well, just because, simple as that. But we had honorable mentions for others, for others in, in the thing, including, including Angela Lansbury, even though she wasn't it's like a, a hot uh, young woman. She was um, a classical, yeah. very, very good actress and a very, very strong uh, part as well. But um, for me and Margaret, every day. Yeah. I think ne next to that, it's got to be Shelley Fabre. Yes. That yeah, I love her to bits. Love her to bits. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mike? Well, Anne Margaret. Anne Margaret. Okay, I think everyone can be in agreement that Anne Margaret is the queen of leading ladies with Elvis. Is concerned. <laughs> but besides Anne Margaret, Mike, pick someone else. 
Well, see now, so that in that wasn't it. Mary Tyler Moore was the um, change of habit. Yeah, change of habit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like I like that chemistry. It was it was very sweet. See, and I love Judy Tyler. I think Judy did. Oh Judy yes. and Elvis, they just so good together on screen. I, yeah, but there was there was there was a lot of the um, when we talked about this in the in the actresses the other day, is you know what, when we always say what's your favourite and and then it was like the comedy ones as well that, oh. that like the um, Missy Gate Missy Gate Missy Gate in in the, <laughs> in, uh, in in the Blue Hawaii we we had a lot of a lot of them like uh, uh, what is it uh, uh, was it Anne Langdon what somebody Anne Langdon I've forgotten what her name was Susan. Um, so, yeah, was it yeah. Su Susan Ann Langdon, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. Frank you know, she was one of those. And, um, yeah, there were some good comedy actresses as well as just the just the babes, wasn't there? But also, at the, uh, uh, probably at the height of her career as well, you had Nancy Sinatra, who was my uh, uh, number two. Uh -huh. And, you know, I just love her, I love her voice. I was I was watching um, You Only Live Twice the other day and it's my favourite James Bond theme tune. Um and I think she looked fantastic as well. I think she was a de she was a decent a decent actress as well when it you know when it came to it. Didn't do very much acting, but uh... no, I I don't think much of her as an actress. <clears throat> I'm going to stand up and say that. So I just got a Facebook <laughs> message from a listener who who wants to remain anonymous. So I will respect that. Um, but this person asked, what what would you guys have thought about a matchup between Jane Fonda and Elvis Presley in the '60s in a movie? Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, she she was um, in the sixties. She she again. She was at her peak. She was along. She was probably alongside Anne Margaret in 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 the, mm -hmm. uh, where they were in their career at that particular time. In the, certainly in the mid sixties, I think it, it would have been a very different style of movie, though, wouldn't it? It mm -hmm. wouldn't have been a, a slapstick. Anne uh, well, Margaret did kind of did type. Some slapstick, didn't yeah, she? I think, but sort of towards uh, the, the end of that. that. What was that movie? It would have had to have been in the 60s and not the 70s. Yeah. She got very political. Because of the political. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Colonel would not have had that. No. The Colonel would not have had that. No. And he, and he wouldn't have what the billing. It would have had to have been Elvis top of the bill, then her. So that's right. going to be like the, the Barbara Streisland story, wasn't it? That, you know, it, that they wouldn't get the bill. It, they wouldn't have an equal billing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let me run this scenario by you guys. What would you have thought of Elvis in the Peter Fonda role of Easy Rider. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that very, very oh, interesting. Yes. Mike. That's that's a cracking one. That is, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we're all agreed, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. That would have <laughs> been. I think I... Yeah. You know, that's there's a lot of classic movies like that that you think, you know, ha had he had the role, could he have done it? Mm -hmm. And he could, couldn't he? He really could have done. He could have carried that off. I think when Elvis got out of the army, I think his acting confidence, his confidence in acting, was still very, very high. But I think as time went on and he kept doing these slapstick comedies and these uh, musicals, I think there had to have been a little break in his confidence when it came to his acting. And I don't feel like. I feel like he had someone really backing him up and and encouraging him, you know. And we know from from reading and knowing the stuff that we know about Elvis, when he devoted himself to a craft, whether it be karate or the golf carts, I mean, he really delved into whatever it was he was doing. And I feel like he just got complacent with his acting because he kind of just accepted that, hey, okay, this is what I'm going to be having to do now. I think in the 50s, he actually wanted to be a movie star more than he wanted to be a rock star, didn't he? I think so. Yeah. 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 I'd agree yeah. with that. Yeah. You know, I, uh, a few months ago, uh, my husband and I, we watched A Star is Born with Chris Christopherson and a Barbara Streisand. And it oh. was the first time I'd watched that, that, mo that movie, believe it or not. And I really, I could, I could see Elvis in that role. I don't. I can't. I couldn't see him with like the slick back hair and the sideburns. I, 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 I think he probably would have gruffed himself up a little bit, and I think he could have done a fantastic job with that role. Yeah. Not that Chris Christopherson didn't do a bad job. I mean, Chris was great in that movie. I don't want to take anything away from him, but no, he's, uh, he's. I could totally have seen Elvis in that role. It was playing a, a washed-up singer. That would have just. That would have been the big no-no for the Colonel, wouldn't it? Well, it I would think have it would have opened doors to for a lot of other movies. I think that would yeah. have been oh, it would have a, done. New, a new chapter in Elvis's life. I think that would have 
but he would have been able to go on to another chapter in his career and really do some good movies. Yeah, I mean, go on. I I think you know with with the good movies and any of those, um, you know, we 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 said it's a formula movie that he does. It's pick a vehicle, pick a girl, pick a child, pick a country, um, uh, uh, and throw it in the pot. We never had the different genres. We never had the spy movie. We never had, yeah, you know, you know uh, the, uh, he was a detective. We never had great differences did we so there was so much to go you know elvis in space never happened which you know we, we should have, we should have had should have had him uh, uh. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Okay, well, so I think he was he, he was the he was the he was he was the inspiration for Troy Tempest, wasn't he? In Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about him as Captain Kirk? Oh my! Oh God. wow! Wow! Stop! Just stop! Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got some answers in. So you know, I was thinking, I'm like, why is people not commenting? Well, you know, I have blonde roots. Um, you have, I have, you have to scroll down to read comments, and who knew? So. <laughs> <laughs> so first Christine Moore she says her favorite movie is also King Creole she loves the plot she loves his acting and the songs it's one of her favorite um, for one of her favorites and her favorite song in that movie is Young Dreams I see mine is bananas <laughs> yeah. uh, Jennifer Jennifer Vogel favorite movie also King Creole um, and base, best leading lady again Anne Margaret I, I think Anne Margaret is probably the the queen of leading ladies in Elvis movies. It, it, on Facebook after we did the show, it was it was ninety odd ninety nine percent Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, yeah. with with a, with a, a smattering of the others. But yeah, it by by a mile, by a, yeah. by an absolute mile. Uh, Louis, Louise Patterson, Jailhouse Rock, and King Creole again. Anne Margaret. Uh, Deb Bell, Viva Las Vegas, Anne Margaret, and Elvis had great chemistry. You know, I, I think the the relationship that Elvis and Anne Margaret had outside the movie really made them so wonderful within the movie because they weren't really acting; it was real. And it was right. it was just great to watch. Um. Yeah, Colonel. Every time we start talking about Colonel Tom Parker, I, I, I feel myself getting, like, anxious, and I get so angry with him. <laughs> kind of like a chicken on a hot plate, Jamie. Yes, <laughs> totally. You know, I, yeah, it, you know, we, it's, you can find yourself going down a rabbit hole when you, because everything we talk about is like, you know, what, what if, what could have been, it's all hypothetical, <laughs> because in the end, we're, we're, we don't know. We don't know if Elvis would have ever broke away from Colonel Tom Parker. Well, I need to give you a public apology, Jamie Kay, because I finally agree with one thing you said about that movie. And I do think Tom Hanks is the perfect person to play him because he, that is his artistic risk to play the ultimate um, villain. Villain. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people do feel like Colonel Tom Parker was a villain. What do you, what do you guys think, Ian and uh, Vince? He became a villain, certainly. Um, he was what Elvis needed in 1956. Um, he, he needed um, someone to sort of propel him from the local uh, Tennessee into the national spotlight, uh, signing signing uh, away from a Memphis um, uh, record company into a, a national, an international one with RCA. And but certainly by about 64, 65, that should have been it, really, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. In my it, opinion, anyway, you know. Yeah. I think, don't, don't you believe also that you need to have to, to, to find, to, to get to fame, there has to be a certain amount of infamy on the other side of it, doesn't there? There has to be some infamous activity to kind of as a catalyst. To, yeah, there has to be a ruthlessness, of course, yes. Yeah, and, and, that, and that was, and so Tom Parker was the flip side of Elvis's coin of fame. He was yeah. the infamous side of that yeah. coin. Absolutely. I think when you watch Jailhouse Rock and you think of, of when she's setting him up as, as management and they get that, the accountant, lawyer, whatever he was in, and he's already written the contract up with the, with the, with the, the figures. Um, it's that one that they, they, they did it in the movie there, didn't they? They, they must have 
push the ruthlessness of the colonel in, in that little character the, in the, jail. The, prob- the, prob- the problem is, is that, is that the colonel uh, did not um, take... Um, see, in, in the Jailhouse Rock character, he was not interested in the music business whatsoever. He was not interested in in how it works. He was just he just wanted to get it out there and, 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 and put the money in the bank. Colonel Parker wanted a finger in every single pie. He wanted artistic control. He he wanted merchandising rights. He wanted merchandising control and and, and where Elvis's likeness could be a thing. He, he wanted to, he wanted to know how RCA were going to market the records, and the fact that we're going to move away from studio albums and onto soundtrack albums. So he wasn't um, he wasn't sidelined as as just the guy who was making all the figures work in the right direction. He he wanted fingers in every pie. And that was probably the problem. He was too hands on. Mm-hmm. You, you think so? You think he had a, when he was technical advisor, do you think he actually did anything? I, I, I think it was just to get another cut for him, not another cut for Elvis. Mm-hmm. That was him. I can have another 3%. I can have 2% of the 5% of the 6%. Um, and, and he was always getting that extra cut for him rather than for Elvis. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, think, I think Colonel Tom Parker, his, his, what happened with him, I, you know, I, I like to think there's good in, in everyone, but at some point the man just got really greedy and it was to Elvis's downfall in his career because it didn't become what was best for his client, for his, the talent. It became what was best for Colonel Tom Parker. And whether that meant paying Vegas debts for mm-hmm. gambling, uh, you know, whichever story you go with, that's exactly what happened, isn't it? Mm-hmm. We, we were getting some um, feedback from our listeners. Louise says Parker was a villain near the end. He kept pushing Elvis so many shows a day with no rest, all to make money to pay for his gambling. He was not interested go. in Elvis as a person. He was only interested in making money. I have to agree with that. Uh, That's Jennifer, certainly how he finished off. Jennifer Vogel says, I don't think Colonel is black and white. He's not that simple. He only became a villain. 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 Gosh, I can't talk now. I'm not even drinking. He only became a villain when he put I have one of mine. When he put him in those movie contracts. Prior to the draft, Elvis needed to be managed. Yes, he did. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. we've discussed this before. Elvis was his own worst enemy. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it, 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 he was so much a self sabotager. It, it, you know, when you think about all the money that he spent and given it away, you know, do you sometimes I wonder, and, and it may have been addressed before, but sometimes I, I, I don't feel like Elvis felt deserving of his success. Yeah. I think he's a country, he's a country boy who's pretty much overnight got money. You've had nothing all your life, and then you've got tons. Uh, and you just share it, and you haven't. It doesn't have the worth that it's not. Oh, I've got to save it for the rainy day. It's it's party time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think, Mike? Do you think that? I I agree. Look at his roots. You know, you didn't get any poorer than that. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. And 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 you know, and and a lot of that comes to his spiritual side too, right? You know, it's better to give than to receive. Yeah. yeah, that was a big part of Elvis's upbringing too. We we got a oh go ahead sorry. Well, I was just going to say you can tell that by when he's singing gospel. Yeah, that is true. Absolutely. Uh, we got a question from Matt Ward. So could Elvis have gotten out of it? Everyone acts like Elvis wasn't at some level complacent in his career. Complacent in his career. <laughs> he didn't understand it. He didn't yeah. understand the workings of his contracts. Um, he didn't understand the workings of Hollywood or with RCA Records. Um, neither did his father. Um, but but from post-68 and 69, when you had people like Steve Binder and Chips Merman in his life who told him to do something different, and we've got the 68 Special and the 69 Memphis Sessions to, to prove that something could happen... You know, he should have he, he should have tagged onto these people. It was got rid of the get rid of the yes man. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I, I think yeah. that was a lot I, a lot to do with, you know, we talked about Elvis' in, um, insecurity when it came to business. You know, his dad had a very simplified view of, of, of finances. And here's a th- this is why I, Matt, uh, I'm talking to Matt Ward right now. I, I disagree with you. Yes, Elvis did know people, but Colonel had something over on Elvis, whether he had him convinced that he couldn't do it without him or colonel had something like uh, you know a blackmailing issue over him there was something that kept elvis with the colonel it wasn't yeah. that he could could do better we we know that he could do better than colonel tom parker towards towards the end there but for some reason elvis didn't believe it he did not believe that he could do it without the colonel and i think every time he got because he fired i think he fired colonel like twice yeah, and to get him out of the contract, the, the colonel would would give him a, a huge, you know, bill and say, "Well, you have to get out of the contract. You have to pay this." But at some point, the fact that this man, Colonel Tom Parker, was getting fifty percent of his clients, it it, it just doesn't mean it's mind boggling. It, it should have been illegal, shouldn't it? It should have been. He was done. Do you think that if you look at Graceland and, and all the stuff they put out, they kept everything? You know, the fa- I haven't got every wage slip that I ever earned or every everything else. W- was Elvis and his dad constantly thinking this is over tomorrow? This is I the think, end. I think that Vernon, that was a big fear for Vernon. Was that yeah, was so, so he, kept, he kept everything just in case, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Whereas Elvis was very, with Elvis had the mentality, you know, this all could be gone tomorrow. I want to share my wealth. I want to give people gifts. I want to do this because I may not be able to do it one day. Vernon was the opposite. This may all go away tomorrow. Uh, let's not. Let's keep everything. Let's, you know, he was very, uh, very cheap in that way. Yes. Do we think that post 1972, 73, when Elvis split up with Priscilla? Uh, that she also joined the colonel. Uh, thought of you, you, you keep it quiet, honey. Otherwise, you know, the fourteen-year-old me is going to come out and, and start telling stories. Yeah. Just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we got. I don't. Dis- I don't know. Is the answer? You know. So. Yeah. No, I don't know either. We I, we got a disagreement here on our. So Matt Ward says, "Oh, what happened?" <clears throat> Oh, I just clicked on another live video. I, sorry, dude, that I just exit out of the live video. <laughs> um, so Matt Ward says that he Matt believes that Elvis could have gotten out of the contract that Elvis didn't want to. He says that he did fire him. Um, um, Elvis didn't like confrontation. Now Matt says that Colonel Tom Parker didn't get the fifty percent. He says that he'll send the numbers. He goes, everyone repeats that, but it isn't true. Now, everything I've read, all the books I've read, it, it, I always thought towards the end, uh, what was in the 70s, when they renegotiated the contract, Colonel Tom Parker put it in there that he would get a 50% uh, commission. That's that's that, that would be my belief. If, if, if there's something out there which is fact and different, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, read that. Yeah. I think that that was the thing with it. It, it was, was that 50% of show earnings and then there was another percentage of earnings from uh royalties and another one from badges and whatever so probably overall it didn't add up to that perhaps that's the figure he's working on but but as a a sort of 50 50 down the line was was what it seems to have been uh, said most places doesn't it well, they, start, they started from scratch, didn't they, from 72, 73, because they sold all the, um, the musical rights to RCA. So RCA didn't never, then never paid royalties to Elvis yeah. on uh, future releases. Um, so would the, because then, then Elvis and the Colonel split the money, I think it was $5 million, pounds, or $5 million at the time. Um, so would they have split that? From, would the contract have gone from that time when they, when they sold off the rights? Who knows? I would imagine that piece of paper exists in the vaults. Yeah. We need to do some research on that. I, I think that's yeah. a future episode. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> now, Jennifer, um, she made a really good point. Now, we know that the, the, the guys that Elvis had around the Memphis Mafia, um, Colonel 
you know, he 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 didn't have a lot of respect for those guys. Um, but they um, they most of those guys had really good business sense. And she says that. Um, where did it go? It says, part of the issue, Elvis didn't value the guy's opinion, yet those guys had paid more attention to business dealings and could have helped him. You think that, that the guys would have uh, helped him? I think, well, they'd be killing the golden goose, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Did we lose? No, we didn't. Did, did, you, did um, I haven't read it for ages. Elvis, what happened? Did they talk about it in that at all? In what? It's been years. In Elvis, what happened? Did the guys talk about the business side of things? Or it's been years since I've read it. So did they, br did. did they bring it up then? They didn't, did they? I don't think they did. I don't think no? they did. I think there was a part in the book um, where Sonny talked about uh, A Star is Born. And now Sonny yeah. West's version was that it, Elvis said that he started making up excuses as to why he could, wouldn't do it. He Sonny put all the blame on Elvis for not doing that movie. Mm. That's only the business thing that I can, I can remember. Yeah, I, I, so I've been, been young so long since I'm ready. Yeah. Get your questions together for Dave Hebler. I'm hopefully seeing him in August. <laughs> oh, are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah, so Dave, I'm, um I'm actually Facebook friends with Dave Ebler. I would love to have him on the show. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, hopefully I'll be seeing him in a, in a, at a, a function in in Europe at the end of August. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Um, what this is this is cute, you guys. So Deb Bell, she she writes. We can agree. Where did she go? Oh, she says. Well, I lost you, Deb. I don't know. She basically, but Deb had said we can all agree that Elvis was a hunk of humanity. Yes, he was. He was a hunk. Um, Louise Patterson says the guys who were around Elvis in the seventies only wanted to be around him for the money and the lifestyle they got from him. See, this is another misconception here. People seem to think that the, these guys made a lot of money. They did not get paid a lot of money for what they did. I think it was like one hundred fifty dollars a week. Yeah, it, it was a it was a it was a living wage almost, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but the but the but the but the perks were that they didn't have to spend too much of that money um, because Elvis would buy them a car, Elvis would buy pay the mortgage on their house, um, and and stuff like that, wouldn't he? So uh, so I think it was um, that was also a thing for them, similar to Elvis in the '60s and then '70s, where Elvis would get entrenched in the movies, and in the '70s Elvis would get entrenched in touring. Now these guys were just entrenched in Elvis, mm -hmm. so they they you know one or two one or two went away, didn't they? Lamarck, Fike, Jerry Schilling, people like they they disappeared. They they went and did their own thing, um, but they, but they got into into a rut of a lifestyle as well, didn't they? Yeah, and, and working for Elvis was not a, like an eight to five job. It was twenty four seven. So you had to live and breathe Elvis Presley's world. It, it, yep. And these guys, you know, some of these guys in the '60s before Elvis got married, they were getting married. They were having kids. And I think I think there, in one of the books, I think it was Billy Smith. Yeah, it's Billy Smith. He actually went to go work on the railroad, and Elvis begged for him to come back. And but it, it, it's and you know that they were family, so. It, I could see where it would be hard to, to say no to, to, to family, but then, you know, that, that's your boss. Um, yeah, look. they had a rotor, didn't they? They had, they had a 24-7 rotor about um, who who was on duty for that night. It was almost, it was almost like a looking after for royalty, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was. Well, and part of it is those guys were an anchor to, to who Elvis was. Yeah. Where he started, right? I mean, that's... Uh -huh. That's the touchstone of of who Elvis. I mean, before he was Elvis, he was just a guy, right? These are the these are the guys that knew him when he was just a guy when they started out. So I think that that keeping that touchstone, you know, of of the core of who you are, he be. He'd want them around him of where he's been. 
Yeah. yeah, that's why I keep Vince around, keep my feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you kept me because you needed a sex symbol. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I keep Mike around. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I did get clarification um, from Jennifer Vogel. Um, and in the book, Elvis, what happened? They did not discuss anything to do with Elvis's business uh, ventures yeah. with the colonel. Um, uh, Louise Patterson also makes a good point. Um, she says that the guys showed their true colors when Elvis died and they had to get their money elsewhere. Now, I, I guess, I guess I, could, I see her point in some ways. Um, but I also see, I, I guess I, I think of it, of it like this. Um, I, yes, we can all agree that what some of the guys have said in their interviews after Elvis died, you know, I'm not a fan of. And I think everybody I'm sure they have some regrets of some of the things that they said, but you, they were there with Elvis because Elvis wanted them to be, and they did sacrifice a lot, um, to, to work for Elvis. And granted, everybody has free will. They made that choice, but I, I can see where some of these guys were kind of lost after Elvis died. And let's not forget that's within a week or two weeks of of the death of Elvis, uh, Vernon started firing everybody, didn't he? Oh yes. So 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 yes, so these so these so these guys these guys they had to they, you know bills don't stop coming, mm -hmm. mortgages don't stop being paid, um, so no matter what you think of them, and um, we do we do disagree or agree with their opinions or their stories or their opinions of Elvis, um, they <laughs> you know the, these these guys still had bills to pay. Yeah, one interesting story um, that I read. Um, it was an Alana Nash's book, Memphis uh, Revelations from the Mif Memphis Mafia. So Charlie Hodge was still living at Graceland. And mm. Charlie Hodge, after Elvis died, Charlie would have coffee with Vernon on the porch. And they, every day they would, they would have their they, – every morning they would talk. And one day Charlie goes to the office to get his paycheck. And instead of a paycheck, it was a, his pink slip. Now, just a couple of hours before that, he was having coffee with, with Vernon – Nothing was said. He goes and gets his paycheck. It wasn't a paycheck. It was his pink slip. And he had like, you know, just a couple of days to move out of, of the grounds of Graceland. No notice. That's just it. And Vernon was kind of like that. He, he did that to Dave and Red and Sonny. He just, he fired them with no severance, no anything. And Elvis, and Elvis would allow his father to do that. And, and this goes back to how he was with the colonel. Why do you guys think that he would let his dad, who, because from everything that we've read, Elvis loved these guys, and he would just be like, okay, I'm, dad, you deal with it, and he cut them off like that. Is, is, is Vince still there? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm still here. I, I'm, I, I, I thought, thought you got to sleep. <laughs> I've been out and mowed the lawn. It's a point to ponder. Yeah. <laughs> What was the question? Well, I, I, my question was, I, I need a drink <laughs> now. Um, my question was, is why do you guys think that Vernon, uh, that Elvis allowed Vernon to make some of these decisions when it came to the guys and and not really deal with it head on? Why why Sonny and he, Wet, he, Red and Dave were fired, Elvis let Vernon fire them, cut contact, and then... Do you think he was misinformed? Do you think he was sort of primed? You know, I'll do it for you. You know, they're no good. Um, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Sort of, sort of like fed him the line. But do you think? But see, this is where I feel like Elvis sometimes just got so overwhelmed with like life in general that he would just allow. Elvis wasn't a stupid man. Like he knew these guys. He knew how his dad was. It's almost like he was like at that end. He was just starting to just give a lot away his away his power. I think he had all these guys on the payroll, didn't he? And he almost he, he almost saw his father as part of that payroll in a way that's uh, may, may not, not the payroll such, but certainly like a chief executive of the household. So, okay. Um, so, sorry to interrupt. We just got a couple of questions. Um, uh, someone's asking, who's digging the ditch in the background? Yeah, I was wondering that. <laughs> Mike, is that you? Are you digging a ditch? I don't think so. No. <laughs> I'm sitting. I'm sitting in. I'm sitting now. It's not me. 
Yeah, I'm know. sitting here. I, I'm not hiding the body at all. Okay. No. All right. Now look at me, Ian. <laughs> Ian? I, I'm just sitting here quietly drinking. <laughs> we don't know where the, nose, the noise is coming from, Matt. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so when, yeah. the, when the chain stores, when the chainsaw starts, get worried. Yes. Okay. Get worried. <laughs> Where yeah. did I put those plastic bags? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's Dexter. I knew I knew him from somewhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was so funny. All right, you guys. Well, we're running out of time. We're almost at an hour. So I'm going to give each a person a chance to give the last words, so to speak. And I'm going to start with, oh, wait, before, before we do that, what, this is a really good question and I really want to address it. Was Elvis really ha happy at the end of his life? Well, Ginger was a babe, so I'd have thought so. Yeah, he was pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I don't do you think, think so. You don't think so? I don't think so, no. Do you think it was just the think, last year of his life, or do you think it was he, he was just un, unhappy for, for a while? Well, I think it probably started when uh, he and Priscilla split. Mm. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's, that's my take on it. That's so when it broke up the family. That would be yeah. that would that would have been so important to him, wouldn't it? Yeah, because that that was who Elvis was, right? He was all about family. And yeah. I, I and I've read that in a lot of books that Elvis, you know, he wasn't mon monogamous by nature, and even though he <laughs> he was not like your, you know, typical married man, he did believe in the institution of marriage, and he I I, I think he probably wanted to just have his cake and eat it too but i don't think he really wanted uh, a, a divorce in his life but i also don't d don't believe that he really wanted to get married to begin with so i think that that was a really a crushing blow to him but i think he got over it i mean he got you know sheila ryan linda thompson sybil shepherd <laughs> ginger alden he he found a way to to uh but is that an insecurity really yeah, you know, he. I, I do believe Elvis was insecure. I do believe. Yeah, that. and 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 sleeping around was, you know, it, it's the it's the ego trip. It's the ultimate ego, isn't it? Every woman wants me. I've never said that before out loud. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then everything changes when you become a dad, too. Yeah. 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 What about you, Ian? Do you think uh, El Elvis was happy at then towards the end of his life? Ian? Wake up, Ian. <laughs> no, Did we lose Ian? Out. Hang on, sorry, I'm here. I'll press the wrong button again. <laughs> All right. Oh, I've heard sorry. that before. Uh, yeah, I could hear you, but I, you couldn't hear me. Right, anyway, yeah, so uh, Ginger said that Elvis was happy. Um, he, she said that he was looking to advance his career and do something different, you know, to lose weight, uh, to get back into a movie maybe, and do something different, maybe tour in Europe. Um Elvis himself, complacent and without the energy because of his health problems, without the energy to actually physically do anything about it, he, he, I think he was tired. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't know whether he was happy or sad. I certainly think he was tired and um, was very, very sort of lethargic about making these changes that Ginger said he wanted to make. So I, I don't know. Were he's happy? Uh, who knows? I, don't know. I think you listen, listen to the very last concert, the bootleg of the very last concert, and he's in fine. Yeah, he's in fine form there. The voice is excellent on that. So you know, it's not like he'd given up. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, soundboards that I think are over. You know, they're, they're, it's all boring, boring, same thing. But that concert. You know, he didn't know it was the last one, um, but I think that's that's pretty much says he he still had the world in his hand. He still did it. He had the voice, and he didn't look as bad as they made out. See, that's the thing I don't understand because I've seen pictures of him in that last year of his life, and you know, minus the CBS special, you know, the, he he the makeup. I mean, he did not look that good. But there have been other pictures. He did not look unhealthy to me. He looked like a you know a typical forty something year old man with a dad bod. Um, he, he definitely was not ugly. I mean, 
There's yeah, three guys there's breathing three, in 40s. here. I mean, you, you know, I, I, look, my husband's 46. He's rocking the dad bod, let me tell you. But it's not, they, they may, the media may portray Elvis as this, you know, overly obese, uh, lethargic man. And, but if we look at some of the pictures and, and, and things, you don't really see that. What do you think that came from? Do you think it was because the world just wanted to keep Elvis in a, in a, in a, a time warp and keep him that, that young, you know, 1950s Elvis, and they just wasn't allowing this man to get older and grow. Is that why we've never had it in concert released? Because that is the image. That's that is the the fat Elvis. Although if you look at the suits at Graceland, they don't look like fat bloke suits. Um, so they don't. No, they really, no. they really don't. So it is the you know the lights and cameras um, and the makeup, like you say. But but they haven't issued that as a proper DVD release. Now you know, and they're hiding that fat and forty thing. Yet they're pushing that with the ETAs. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, there you go. There you go. Like I say, look when you when you see one of his suits uh, up close and personal, um, as as we hope that you do in August, Jamie, if you can get there, um, you'll you'll I see that it. these. These 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 suits are not of a guy who is obese, mm -mm. yeah, no, not no, a, not yeah. not at all. And this is going right up to seventy six and seventy seven. And you can see the sundial suit from seventy seven yeah. uh, when you're there. We've seen that in London. And I'll tell you what, this is this is not a guy who ex externally was was huge and constantly bloated. He, there's no way he's getting in that suit mm -hmm. if he is, you know, you know. If he, if he's if he's permanently overweight, there's no way he's getting in that suit. His medication and his illnesses would would dictate that his body uh, would expand and contract um, almost almost daily. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, we we yeah. I mean, Elvis did uh, suffer from from bloating. He would get bloated. And yeah. His weight would go up yeah. and down, but based on you know the foods he 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 would eat. Um, but you know, I keep thinking about those pictures. They were taken in March of 1977 when Elvis was in Hawaii with Ginger yeah. and, and, and the guys. And he's playing football. He's running yeah. around. I mean, he, 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 you, you could tell he had a little, I call it a dad bod. He, got, he had a little tummy, but he didn't look obese or. An average guy in his 40s. Yeah. Yeah. Around. yeah. 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 Um, um, Louise uh, Patterson says that uh, she she agrees with you guys. She went to Graceland in in 2018, and and the suits weren't oversized. However, Matt says that they clip them and make them look good on the mannequin. I don't I don't know if that's true, because you and, uh, maybe they do something to make them look good on the mannequin. But we we've seen pictures of him in that last year, and we we are all in agreement he wasn't this huge obese um, no. man. And it's really sad, you know, and it's really sad that they, I really wish they, I, I don't wish that the CBS special didn't, um, didn't happen because I think it was a, a good thing. I just wish somebody would have maybe have said, you know, you don't need all that makeup. You, this, this one jumpsuit that you're wearing tonight, eh, probably not a good idea. Yeah, um, the hair. I mean, he that just wasn't a good look for him in that that special. It's really harsh lighting as well as as TV. Had that been a movie, that would have been a very different style of lighting, mm -hmm. uh, and more of a that's the way it is. It, it could have looked completely different. Mm -hmm. it, it just yeah, and but you know you if you if you hear that man's voice in that CBS special, I mean his voice still magnificent. Still, he's still giving it all he had. Yeah, I think oh, nothing beats Unchained Melody from that. That is my argument for anybody. If they said he was washed up and done it, listen to listen to uh, a '77 uh, Unchained Melody, and then tell me, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, he was our Elvis, and um, whatever we did for those what twenty something years he was in show business, we love him for it. Yes, we do. All right. Okay, guys, we're wrapping up to the end of this episode, our first Facebook Live episode for the Jungle Room Podcast. I'm going to give each of you guys one minute to say a shout out, give your last thoughts, and we're going to start with Mike Ford. Well, I got to say, I'm looking forward to you actually making it down there in August. I really hope you do, and uh, it'll it'll really 
it'll be a life changing thing for you because uh, just walking across through the gates, um, you know, I, I was a little flippant about the tour when I took it a few years back, but you know, that it ended with that gal that, uh, did we ever determine if she went to high school with him? Um, which girl? I can't remember, but there's so many girls in my life. The gal at the end of the tour, the gal at the end of the tour that I was telling you oh, about, and you thought right. that it might have been somebody. Yep. Um, oh shoot, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember. Yeah. I'm sorry. Anyway, it's just, uh, and uh, I'm just. Uh, this has been um, amazing to, to get to meet all you guys, and and Jamie K. I just thank you very much for letting me be part of this fun, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing. What it sound? What, what it's like for you to go to Graceland? Yes, um, yes. It was Aunt Delta, Mike. Aunt Delta was the one Aunt that was Delta. living yeah. in Graceland. Yes, yep, yep. Mike, I appreciate you a lot. You know that, and I can't. I couldn't do the show without you. Hand, hand to well, God. Have fun. All right, I- Ian. Uh, listen, just thanks for inviting me on this, to, uh, Jamie. Um, through Elvis. Um, we have got to know so many different people in so many different walks of life. Uh, myself and Vince met through Elvis, and here I am now talking to you and Mike uh, through Elvis. And we love doing the radio show. We love doing the podcast. We love all these people who have, who have contributed on the Facebook feed as well. And um, yeah, it's it's just like enjoy enjoy Graceland. You will love it. I will be hopefully getting there at some point in the near future as well. And just enjoy what we have and celebrate it and let's just keep Elvis's name out there. Thank you very much for uh, letting us join in tonight. Oh, no, you're welcome and thank you. Vince, you're up. Yeah, great. Thanks for inviting us. Um, I, I'm supposed to be going to Memphis in June this year. So I, I think that's pretty much a, a dead cert now, now. Um, so I'll have to try and join you in August. Um, but yeah, enjoy it, live it, love it. This is the best thing with Elvis is we've we haven't always agreed, but we haven't had a punch up, and I love that. I love that everybody has an opinion, and it works. And we go, that's a good idea, or you know, you're talking absolute whatever. But I'll appreciate it. I've loved it tonight. I, I could talk about Elvis, and I do, twenty four seven. I've I've got I'm opinionated. I love it. Um, more more power to your elbow keep the keep the jungle rooms going we love it oh thank you guys well very quickly i want to thank all three of you Uh, i've said this so many times and i'm sure everyone's sick of me saying this but you know it's so true elvis presley was a connector of people and here he is 42 and a half years after his death he's still connecting individuals through his music and through his movies and through his life and I I think I thank all of you and I really want to thank our listeners because without you guys we wouldn't have a show and it's because of you guys (laughs) so yes a big hand to our listeners thank you guys so much thanks for for tuning in on this Saturday for our first ever Facebook live the Jungle Room podcast. As you guys know, the Jungle Room podcast is brought to you by Pizza Man and Eagle River, Alaska. I am Jamie Kay. I am Ian Bray. I'm Vince Wright. <laughs> Until next time. Bye. Bye.